Good evening, everybody. And it's my great privilege to welcome all the attendees and the faculty to our this webinar. This is our sixth webinar in our webinar series. And uh, the topic for today's webinar is limitations of gene expert and line probe assays with case studies. I am Dr. Aparna Bhanushali and I lead the scientific initiatives at uh, Keystack Analytics. And I really um, am uh, happy to be with the faculty, the distinguished faculty that we have today for our webinar. Could you go to the next slide, please? So, so the webinar, this webinar is an initiative by Haystack Analytics and Thyrocare Laboratories. Haystack Analytics is a tech company. We're a startup placed in IITB. The whole objective of Haystack Analytics is to create disruptive solutions and de-bottleneck de some of the existing genomics um, tests and assays. Thyrocare Technologies, as everybody is aware, is the leading diagnostic provider with a pan-India presence. They have a specialized vertical called the Focus TB, under which they aim to get innovative, or rather they provide innovative, as well as quality and affordable diagnostics for, for the TB uh, testing. Our agenda for the session is going to be, uh, can I have the next slide, please? We will first have a presentation by Dr. Nikhil Sarandar. He is our chief guest uh, for the uh, webinar today, and I welcome Dr. Sarandar. We will then have two sessions by our guest speakers, Dr. Anirvan Chatterjee from Haystack Analytics and Dr. Chaitali Nikam from Thyroke Technologies, which will then be followed by a Q&A session. So with this, I would like to introduce our speaker for the session today, our chief guest speaker, Dr. Nikhil Sarandar. Dr. Nikhil is a chess consultant with independent practice in Mumbai. He's, he's the former, he was a former associate professor, Department of TB and Chest Disease, KJ Somaya uh, College, Mumbai. He's also been the organizing secretary of the NAPCON 2016 in Mumbai, as well as the NAPCON 2020, which was a virtual uh, conference. He's been the organizing secretary of 16 national conferences and nine workshops, and has been the recipient of eight prestigious Young Scientist Awards. He's also been the recipient of the NCCP, Professor P. S. Shankar, Professor K. C. Mohanty, Chest Oration 2020, and has been the editor of, rather, is the editor of the NCCP newsletter, The Lung Bulletin. He's also authored 27 chapters in textbooks and 14 articles in journals. Dr. Nikhil, I welcome you, and I look forward to this really uh, exciting session, which will be on how you are uh, incorporating the TB diagnostics in your clinical practice, some of the li limitations and the interesting case studies. So really looking forward to your session, Dr. Nikhil. Our next speaker uh, is going to be Dr. Anirvan Chatterjee. Dr. Anirvan is the founder and the CEO of Haystack Analytics, which is a leading startup in the field of genomic ana analytics incubated at uh, Sign IIT Bombay. Dr. Uh, Anirvan is a postdoc from the University of Oxford, the UK, and also has an additional postdoc from the Technical University of Denmark, Denmark. Dr. Anirvan's life mission, as he puts it, is to bring innovative solutions and make a difference in the lives of the countless TB patients with whom he has worked for more than two decades. So welcome, Dr. Anirvan. Look forward to your um, look forward to how you are creating the diagnostic innovative solutions in TB, as well as we hope to have other sessions where we will enlighten us about some of the other solutions that Haystack Analytics is offering. Dr. Chaitali Nikam is our um, next guest speaker. She will lead. The, she leads the infectious disease portfolio at Thyrocare Labs. Like I said, Thyrocare is uh, one of the adopters. Is in uh, getting innovative technologies on board for uh, solutions in the diagnostic domains. Dr. Chaitali is a member of the Constitution of National Technical Working Group on Private Provider Engagement under the NACP. She's also a member of the National Technical Working Group on collaboration between NTEP and corporate hospitals and laboratories. Dr. Chaitali has 38 publications in peer-reviewed journals to her credit. So 
just before we start the uh, webinar, a few ground rules, which are the, the, norm, the norm for any, before commencing any webinar is the way you are going to address the questions. You could please, um, it would be preferable if you could tab, uh, type them in the chat box and we will answer all the questions at the end of the session. If you all want it to be directed to a specific faculty, kindly write the name of the faculty and we will direct it to that. Otherwise it will be at my discretion as the moderator of this session. So with that, uh, I, uh, Dr. Nikhil, the floor is all yours, and we look forward to an exciting session. Thank Are my slides visible? Yes, Dr. Nikki. Hello. Are yes, my slides? Sir. Yeah. So I'll proceed. Yeah, please. Yeah. So thank you. Good evening, everybody. At the outset, I'd like to thank Haystack Analysis and Thyroke for organizing this webinar. I also thank all our attendees who have joined us and also those who will be joining us soon. The topic for today the limitations of gene expert in line probe assays with case studies. Right before I begin, I'll pay a tribute to the departed soul of my late teacher, Emeritus Director Professor Dr. K.C. Mohanty, who was the doyen of tuberculosis in India and was awarded President's Medal of the TB Association of India for a lifetime achievement in combating and controlling tuberculosis in his lifetime. So friends, just uh, before we begin the talk, something light. You know, this is coffee. On the left, you have instant coffee, which takes hardly 30 seconds to prepare with boiling water. And you have on the right filter coffee, which we know takes more time. Ultimately, we know which one of these two tastes is better. And why I'm showing this? Because we have a lot of tests in tuberculosis. Some of them are rapid tests. But I just want to show you that rapid is not always good. Okay, so coming to TB diagnosis, we do it by the CRP and way. C is clinical, R is radiological. E is pathological and M is microbiological diagnosis. Clinical and radiological are subjective or presumptive diagnosis of TB, whereas pathological and microbiological diagnosis are definitive diagnosis of TB because you can actually see what is happening inside the patient or inside the lesion. So just to ask you, which is the most rapid test to diagnose TB? The first, which I have shown here, is sputum smear per acid fast bacilli. The second is CBNAT or gene expert. And the third is the good old chest x-ray. So I feel of all these, the good old chest x-ray is the fastest because you instantly get a presumptive diagnosis. For decades, it was the basis for TB diagnosis and treatment. Chest x-ray remains the first investigation of choice in any suspected pulmonary or pleural disease. And even in patients with extra pulmonary TB, it can help you assess coexisting pulmonary lesions. So broadly, you have diagnostic tests for TB classified into two types, direct tests, which detect the presence of mycobacterium tuberculosis in the body, or indirect tests, which measure the body's response to mycobacterium infection. Regarding our microbiological tests, they can be broadly classified into four types, microscopy, that is zeal Nielsen and modified acid fast stains, fluorescent microscopy, then culture, which is your phenotypic test, you have the solid and liquid culture, you have molecular techniques, which is your genotypic tests, such as the gene expert and LPA, which we'll be talking about today, and we have other tests. So coming to culture, you have the solid and the liquid. Solid culture, the turnabout time is six to eight weeks with another few, uh, some more time for DST and liquid culture is much faster with some days for DST. Now, having said that, culture remains the gold standard for TB diagnosis. The advantages of culture is that it fulfills Cox postulates for a definitive diagnosis. That is to say you have a clear association between the disease and the organism. It provides specific standardized drug susceptibility testing, rendering individualized treatment possible. It differentiates mycobacterium tuberculosis from other mycobacteria. Cultures are highly sensitive and specific even for extrapulmonary samples. And culture conversion occurs with successful therapy, so it can be used as a monitoring tool. 
the disadvantages of culture are that it's time consuming it's expensive cultures are prone to contamination and you have biosafety hazards particularly with liquid cultures there's a lot of aerosol generation so now to take away some of the disadvantages of culture mainly the time the expense and other things we have molecular tests which have come up since the last two and a half decades what do these molecular tests do first and foremost they detect the presence of mycobacterium tuberculosis in the specimen they identify the mycobacterium species as mtb and they identify drug resistance if it is present so amongst the earliest of these to come was the pcr followed by the gene expert or the expert mtb rip which came in the first decade of this century gene expert as you can see is a very simple test you have sputum liquefaction and inactivation with the reagent transfer of stuff into the cartridge and then insert this cartridge into the mtb rip test platform this is the end of your hands on work after it is sampled processed and you see you get ultimately the readout in 1 hour 45 minutes which will come in two things you will get either the presence of mtb detected or not and if it is detected then whether rip resistance is present or not okay then we have the line probe assay which came soon after the gene expert line probe assay identifies the mtb complex it detects mutations associated resistance to isoniazid and rifampicin which is the genotype mtpr plus or the enolipar ftb and also the genotype mtbrsl which has ofloxacin amikacin and ethambutol line probe assay has good sensitivity and specificity particularly when culture isolates are used and they are positive so what is the sensitivity of all these tests for tb you have the diagnostic pyramid here at the bottom is your midget that is liquid culture followed by cb nat that is your gene expert and then the lpa so gene expert is a very good test it has revolutionized rapid diagnosis and treatment particularly for drug sensitive as well as drug resistant tb how i'll come to that later so the advantages of gene expert are that it enrolls more mdr tb patients since on treatment faster it detects only rif resistance but we know that patients with rif resistance will fail a rifampicin containing regimen so it can be taken as a surrogate marker of mdr tb gene expert quantifies your mtb load as very low low medium or high it has the least biohazard risk of all the genotypic tests and it has good sensitivity both for smear positive smear negative and extra pulmonary samples there are two major disadvantages of gene expert one unlike culture it cannot be used as a monitoring tool because it continues to remain positive even in patients who have successfully completed treatment and are cured two the diagnostic accuracy is critically dependent on the cycle threshold or ct values you know which can be difficult sometimes to analyze particularly for if resistance in samples with low bacillary loads that is mtb low or very low and i'll come to this later in my talk coming to the line probe assay the advantages are that it gives you rapid results unlike gene expert which only gives you rif resistance line probe assay can also diagnose inh resistance therefore giving you a definitive diagnosis of mdr tb and the second line lpa can also give you diagnosis of pre xdr or xdr tb this potential for improved yield of results relative to cultures coming positive and again there is less biohazard risk as compared to culture the disadvantages are that there is a risk of dna cross contamination the test will fail if pcr inhibitors for example blood are present in the sample which can happen sometimes during sample collection and again there is a limited number of drugs for which the line probe assay is standardized okay so basically how do we interpret a gene expert i told you gene expert will give you just two things first and foremost the presence of mtb if that is there then the resistance so if mtb is not detected there is no question of the resistance if mtb is detected but rif resistance is indeterminate it means that the mutation in the rpob gene which encodes resistance to rifampicin could not be determined due to insufficient signal detection because there is insufficient mtb load in the sample so either the load is very low or low okay if you have mtb detected and rif resistance detected then it means that the rpob the mutation is there this patient is rif resistance is likely to fail a rifampicin containing regimen and therefore should be considered for starting treatment on a appropriate regimen for mdr tb and you should also do a full first and second line dst to confirm the diagnosis if your mtb is detected but there is no rif resistance that means there is no mutation in the rpob gene therefore this patient is likely to be rif susceptible and you can start a regimen for drug susceptible tb 
So gene expert basically detects, you see, units A, B, C, D, and E in the RPOB gene, which encodes DNA dependent RNA polymerase or rifampicin. So the gene expert probes, they identify RIF resistance mutations in the RPOB gene by shifting their Tmax away from a wild type reference value. A clear change in the Tmax distinguishes a wild type from a resistant mutant. Now let's just go to some examples of gene expert. You see, this is a basic readout of the gene expert test. This is how it looks like. On the left hand side, you have things such as sample assay, start, end time, and date, and patient information. Okay. Then in the middle on the top, you have the most important part. You have MTB detected or not detected. And if MTB is detected, then a comment on the resistance. You know, these will be in red and green, depending on what is there. If anything is detected, it will be red. And if it is not detected, it will be green. So you see, you have MTB detected. And if it is detected, it will comment on the quantification, whether it is very low, low, medium, or high. Here it is medium. And here if resistance is not detected. So it's a green bar. If it had been detected, it would have been red. Okay, below that, you have the cycle threshold values for five probes. You can see probe A, B, C, D, and E. And here's the sample processing control. The CT values are given here. And below that, you have the real-time PCR curves. For us as clinicians, this is important only, only this part. And if you want to cross-check or analyze the report, the parts that are below. And how to look at them, we'll go through it. Okay. So basically, what Gene Expert does is that it if there's mycobacterial DNA in the sample, it is it is a PCR-based test, a polymerase chain reaction. So the DNA is amplified till a level the target protein can be detected. And this reaction occurs in three phases, baseline, log linear, and plateau phase. And the reaction is measured in the log linear phase of amplification. So ultimately, cycle threshold means the number of times in the, cycle, the PCR cycles have to be repeated before the target protein of interest, in this case, RPOB gene mutations, become detected. So if the bacillary load in the sample is high, the cycle threshold will be low because you have to run the test, you have to run the cycles fewer number of times. If it is low, then you have to have, you have to run the test for more, for more cycles. So the CT values will be high. So this is how it is. So below a certain threshold, you see you will get detection and not detection. Okay, so how do we quantify MTB detection? If the cycle threshold value is less than 16, that means the bacillary load is high. If it is between 16 to 22, it means the load is medium. If it is between 23 to 28, it means that it is low. And if it is more than 28, then it means that MTB was very low. Okay, so just go through a few samples of how to interpret your gene expert and what are the policies. So this is a gene expert. You see here you have MTB not detected. Why not detected? You look at the CT values, you know, on all the probes, they are zero. So MTB not detected, a green band and no comment on the resistance. Second thing, second report, you have MTB detected high. Okay, and you have RIF resistance detected. So both are red bands. Is something missing here? Yes. You got it right, the CT values are. So here they are. So you see what was high, anything less than 16. So you look at the CT values here, probe D14, C12, E13, A12, and this is the sample signal. So you see the software just analyzes the CT values for you. You don't have to do it yourself, but you can correlate easily. So this is MTB high. Now let's look at MTB medium. Again, you have MTB detected medium, so a red bar and no ref resistance, so a green bar. So why medium? Medium was 16 to 22. Okay, so look at this, probe D21, C20, E and B both 21 and A20. Okay, so this is MTB detected medium. But what is the problem here? You see, sometimes you can have discrepancies in, this, in different samples from the same patient at the same site taken a few days apart, even if the even if the quantification is the same, RIF resistance may be discordant. So you see, this is one of my patients. You have MTB detected medium in both samples. RIF resistance not detected in the first, but detected in the second. Now, why medium? I've already told you. You can look at the CT values here. Okay. They are all within the range 16 to 22. But then this is a patient who for two and a half months was failing on a drug susceptible regimen. So he required a diagnosis of MDR TB. Okay. So the first test came like this and we were not able to change therapy. A second test repeated subsequently. 
showed rip resistance and we were able to start this patient on uh, appropriate regimen for MDRTB. All right. Then MTB detected low. Low is what? 23 to 28. Okay. So again, there can be discrepancy in the sample. This is a sample of pericardial fluid and extra pulmonary sample. So here, the bacillary load is always posi bacillary that is to say low or very low. So you can get discrepancies in such type of reports. So here you have MTB detected low and no rip resistance. All right. So low was what? 23 to 28. Let's see. This is 28, 27, 28, 27. Again, A is 26. So yes, it tallies. But then again, you can get discrepancies. On the right-hand side, you have MTB detected low and if resistance detected. All right. So you have to be very careful because this gives you a dilemma when you're dealing with the patient. Last and but not the least, let's look at MTB detected very low. Okay, so MTB detected very low, MTB uh, rip resistance detected. So you have two red bands. And then you see you have again two discrepancies reports. Very low was what? Anything above 28. So you see a uh, probe B is 33, C is 32, E is 32, B is 33, probe A is 31. Again, this was a patient of smear positive pulmonary tuberculosis, a suspected case of drug resistance. So you see, you get a dilemma sometimes when you do gene expert upfront. All right, so you have to use sometimes your clinical assessment. Most of the time, what we do is repeat the test or the sample itself. So all I'm saying is that molecular methods are good methods. Yes, they are. They've revolutionized the turnabout time for starting MDR TB treatment. Initially, when I joined the TB control program, it would take two to three months to diagnose. Nowadays, you can do it in a jiffy and you can start treatment also, you know, rapidly with these molecular tests. But all said and done, they have their diagnostic limitations. I've shown you what some of those are. Just to briefly enumerate, there's variable sensitivity in extra pulmonary disease, smear negative pulmonary disease, TBHIV co-infection, and TB in children. So all said and done, they cannot be recommended to replace conventional methods like culture entirely in select cases. Coming to a case study, we'll just go through it briefly. You have a 44-year-old male of Mumbai presented at one of the major municipal hospitals in February 2014 with complaints of chronic cough for 11 months, progressively increasing shortness of breath for 10 months. Cough was not associated with expectoration or hemoptysis and there was no aggravating or relieving factor either for the cough or the breathlessness. No associated symptoms of chest pain, wheezing, cold, fever, weight loss. Sleep appetite, bowel bladder habits were normal. Prior to presentation, the patient had visited two physicians for his complaints, received symptomatic treatment after investigations, but no definitive diagnosis was done. All right, why I'm discussing the case history because this is important later on. Now, this may not be TB to present with. Okay, and what is the diagnosis I'll come to shortly. Past history did not reveal any major illness or disease. The contact history was insignificant. The patient was a non-smoker and did not consume alcohol or have any other addiction. On examination, his vital signs were stable. Digital clubbing was present, which only indicates that there is something chronic going on in the body. Chest, remark chest examination was unremarkable, except for a few crackles heard bilaterally, which doesn't give us you know, any major information at all. The chest x-ray revealed bilateral micronodular shadows, predominantly in the right lung field, but also in the left lung field. And you know, hemogram was normal except for a borderline elevated ESR. Sputum smear for acid pass bacilli was negative and serology was non-reactive for retroviral disease and hepatitis. Now, based on the above evaluation on this x-ray, the patient was diagnosed as a new case of smear negative pulmonary tuberculosis and prescribed the course of anti-TB therapy of INH, Rifampicin, Pyrazinum and Infanticol. But there is something on this x-ray which gives us an important diagnostic clue which was missed that time. And I'll come to that again shortly. So what happens? This is Feb 2014. However, two months into this treatment regimen, the patient's symptoms have not been relieved and now new symptoms have appeared. He noticed reduction in his weight and his appetite and the appearance of fever. So after three months in May 2014, he comes for a second opinion to us. We also examined him. We took an occupational history. We found that he's been working in a chucky, that is a flour mill, for more than three decades. His father also used to work in the same chucky and he would often assist his father since a very young age. On examination, again, there's digital clubbing, which will tell you that there is some chronic disease going on in the body. 
you have the presence of bronchial breath sounds for the right infracapillary inframammary axillary and upper interscapular area which tells you that there is some pathology in the lung parenchyma or airways and scattered crackles heard bilaterally okay again the cbc does not show anything except for a mildly elevated esr routine biochemistry is like creatinine liver function blood sugar thyroid stimulating hormones total ig which is done in such cases with an x ray like this all were normal ECG and 2D echo again normal. Sputum smear for acid fast bacilli, two samples. CB NAT, which is your gene expert, and LP of sputum again were negative. Spirometry revealed mild obstruction with bronchodilator reversibility, which is expected in a patient like this. So we evaluated him further. We did a chest radiography, which revealed small micronodular shadows in the right. Lung extensively and left lower zone with X shell calcification of the left hilar node. You can see it here, and this is a magnified shot of the same. Now, X shell calcification is suggestive of silicosis, though it can occur in other diseases also. So, why silicosis? I'll come to that again. But what I'm trying to show you is that there is something apart from tuberculosis in this patient. And from X-ray, you go to a high-resolution CT chest, which showed patchy consolidation and branching or tree bud opacities in the posterior segment of the right upper and apical segment of the right lower lobes, adjoining fibrosis, traction bronchic cases, and fibronodular opacities extensively in the right lung field and in the apical segment of the left lower lobe, and enlarging calcified left hilar, prevascular, pretracheal, and paratracheal nodes. So, what have we got here ultimately? You see, we still don't have a definitive diagnosis of TB, okay? Because those green bud opacities can also occur in some viral infections, bronchiolitis, etc. So, further evaluation by fiber optic bronchoscopy to confirm the diagnosis was advised, which the patient consented to. It was performed under local anesthesia and conscious sedation. The bronchioalveolar lavage revealed acid fast bacilli. Gram stain and bacterial cultures were negative. The bronchioalveolar lavage gene expert was positive. Showing mycobacterium tuberculosis with medium load and the presence of drip resistance. Bal samples were also set for mycobacterial culture and thus acute testing to a national credit reference laboratory. So now at least you have a definitive diagnosis. And what is that? You have pulmonary silico tuberculosis, okay, with rifampicin resistance. Now, why silico tuberculosis? Because the presence of silica, the source of silica particles in flammable workers in India is the agra stone, a red stone with an exceptionally high silica content, which is used to chisel the large grinder in the mill, during which a significant amount of silica dust is generated. So the patient is informed and counseled about the diagnosis. Treatment is initiated both for the tuberculosis with rip resistance. Here you have an appropriate anti-TB drug regimen adjusted for body weight regular follow-up. But you also have to treat the symptoms. It's not that you treat the TB and the silicosis will go by itself. You have to treat the symptoms there. So you have to relieve his bronchospasm by giving long-acting bronchodilators and corticosteroid by a dry powder inhale. Is this all? No, it's not all. Mycobacterial culture DST reports at six weeks revealed an extensively drug resistance pattern with the isolate showing resistance to INH, rifampicin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, streptomycin, canamycin, amethacine, and ofloxacin, and susceptibility to other anti TB drugs like moxifloxacin, clopazamine, ethanamide, paraminosalicylate, cyclotrine, thalithromycin, and captiomycin. So six weeks later the treatment regimen has to be changed to a more individualized and dst guided one of moxifloxacin, nitronamide cyclosine paraminosalicylate clarithromycin clopazamine and capromycin in short all the drugs he's susceptible to now why am i showing this i'll come to that again subsequently later in my talk now since the patient was unable to change his occupation for obvious reasons he was advised to use personal protective measures like wearing a mask over the nose and mouth at all times while working in the flour mill so finally after a month of starting this different regimen the patient reported relief of his dyspnea and cough followed by resolution of the fever improvement in his appetite and marginal gain in weight he was monitored with hemograms creatinine liver function and tsh every month and chest radiographs every three months for six months. At the end of six months, a chest HRCT was repeated and re revealed significant clearance of the consolidation and some persistence of some residual lesion. Lung function was stable and sputum mycobacterial culture was negative at six months. The inhaler therapy was continued, the anti-tubercular regimen 
also was continued with the exception of the injectable okay for another 18 months again the patient was monitored every three months by chest radiograph hemogram creatinine tsh and liver function which were normal throughout spirometry was repeated after a year and lung function parameters were stable so ultimately all's well that ends well at 24 months or two years of treatments putting mycobacterial culture is negative HRCT of the chest reveals clearance of the consolidation and persistence of some residual lesions. Anti-TB drug therapy is discontinued at this stage. Inhalation therapy is continued. The patient is advised to continue protective measures like wearing a mask and get himself vaccinated with seasonal influenza and polyvalent pneumococcal vaccines. Since the last four years, the patient is regular with his inhaler therapy, he follows up every six months and is stable, symptom-free and without comorbidities. So what I'm trying to say is that if we had some test earlier, you know, we had to go to three sputum samples coming negative, then two gene experts coming negative before the third one came positive also. So if we had a test, which I'm going to talk about very briefly, you know, this could have changed the management of this patient. He could have been initiated on this regimen much earlier in the course of his disease. So there are some advances as gene expert. You have the expert ultra, which has a larger chamber for DNA amplification and thereby enhanced sensitivity. Less likely to false positives and you can use it with the existing gene expert equipment. All you have to do is upgrade the software. Then you have TrueNet, which is an indigenous test developed by an Indian company in Goa, which requires far less, just half, a, half an ml of sputum as compared to a conventional one or two ml with gene expert. Results come again within one or two hours. It's battery operated and portable with good sensitivity and specificity. Therefore, makes it suitable for field settings. You have some advantage. You have some advances in culture also. You have the microscopically observed drug susceptibility assay or MODS, the nitrate reduction assay or the NRA, and the colorimetric redox indicator. Some of these tests, like the MOD and NRA, are direct, and all three of them can, can also be done indirectly on isolates other than sputum. All right. So now coming to whole genome sequencing, very briefly, I'll go through this. Whole genome sequencing, also known as full genome sequencing, complete genome sequencing, or entire genome sequencing is the process of determining the entirety, or nearly the entirety of the DNA sequence of the genome of an organism at a single point in time. How can it be useful in TB? Friends, resistance in tuberculosis is mainly conferred by nucleotide variations. Whole genome sequencing uses high resolution gene sequencing technology to inter interrogate the entire mycobacterial genome and identify drug resistance across all the anti TB drugs used. In addition, it can also give you a diagnosis of mixed infection, co infection, or heteroresistance. It's now been increasingly recognized and adopted for TRTB diagnosis and treatment in many countries of the world. All right. You have the sample collection, culture enrichment, DNA extraction, pre-sequencing preparation, sequencing, data analysis, and finally, generation of the report. So it's quite complicated. So you look here, you have 18 drugs for which TB whole genome se sequencing can be done. These are the drugs and the genes. You can see them. I'll not go into details. But what is important, unlike your gene expert and LCA, uh, LPA, you can do ESG to so many other drugs which are useful, particularly for treating DRTB. How does it perform? Let's take a look. The sensitivity and specificity to your first-line anti-TB drugs is excellent, both above 90%. Even to your second-line anti-TB drugs, you have very good sensitivity and specificity across the board. And how does it perform versus culture? There is good concordance between culture DST and whole genome sequencing to the tune of 93% as compared to LPA, which is 63%, or CBNAT, which is just 49%. So friends, whole genome sequencing resolves an unmet need. It has, great, it's, it has great potential for rapidly diagnosing any type of drug resistant TB in diverse clinical reference laboratory settings worldwide. And it overcomes many of the limitations associated with conventional phenotypic tests, that is your culture, and also the limitations of other less comprehensive molecular methods, that is your gene expert and LPA. So this was the old diagnostic algorithm for TB. You had clinical symptoms, then you took an X-ray, then you did your sputum smear, then you did a NAT, then based on whether it was positive or negative, again, you would have to do a culture, very long process in short. This was what we used to do seven to eight years ago. And then for pulmonary TB, the standards for TB care in India, a vision document released in 2014, said you have to do microbiological confirmation on sputum, chest X-ray as a screening tool, and then finally go to your CBNAT. 
for extra fungi samples also microscopy culture dst cb net or molecular tests or other things so now whole genome sequencing for tb is recognized and recommended the who also mentions it and there is uh, you see though it has not been fully taken up there is it finds mentioned in the recent guidelines released this year for pro programmatic management of drtb in our country as well the advantages of whole genome sequencing is that it detects genomic sequence variants and phenotypes and guide treatment decisions in drtb it overcomes the challenges associated with conventional phenotypic tests that is your culture because discrepancy in culture for certain rpob for rifampicin and gyre for chloroquinolones in media as well as the complications of diagnosing pyrazinamide drug deals you know pyrazinamide is a drug which works only in acidic medium and all our culture media whether solid or liquid are mainly alkaline so there is discrepancy between drug susceptibility in vitro and in vivo it can be considered a more robust reference standard for in drug resistance profiles it also overcomes the limitations of other less comprehensive molecular tests such as gene expert or lpa by providing rapid and detailed sequence information it can detect hetero resistance or a mix of multiple genetic populations in a clinical sample it assesses lab cross contamination for diagnosis of other infectious diseases finally it's important in the public health domain also because it can identify strain lineage and resistance mechanisms for tb surveillance and recognize genetically related strains for the resolution of transmission chains to direct tb control and elimination efforts the disadvantages are it's expensive it's technically complex it requires a lot of hassle for integration into existing lab workflows specific training and skill requirements and expert guidance also regarding clinical interpretation of the sequencing data there can still be discordance between the detected genes and the resistance phenotype for some drugs particularly chloroquinolones and the breakpoint artifacts that is inappropriately high cc values might lead to misclassification of phenotypes so all said and done friends no lab test is 100% full proof or 100% full proof and phenotypic tests that is your culture and genotypic tests such as your gene expert and lpa are no exception keep in mind the molecular detection of resistance will develop will depend ultimately on the persistent presence of the resistance conferring mutation and ultimate mechanisms of resistance may develop or mutations may appear if the test was not designed to detect and to require phenotypic test to identify resistance as well what will you do even if you have a definitive diagnosis because treatment is not like instant coffee treatment will go for 6 months to 9 months if it is a drug susceptible tb and for at least 2 years if it is a drug resistant tb case sometimes the lesions may persist or enlarge sometimes tb may develop an another site when the patient is on anti tb treatment so you think of lot of things you have to evaluate thoroughly imaging sampling etc think of immune reconstitution of paradoxical reaction don't just think that this is a drug resistant case and you are sometimes face the dilemma of hetero resistance that is different resistant populations at samples isolated from different sites in the same patient so for such cases culture is always superior in theory there is no difference between theory and practice but in practice there is molecular methods may be rapid but then speed and shortcuts don't always win you have the story of the hare and the tortoise yeah and we all know who won the race so my take home messages to wind up or that whole genome sequencing is proving to be the go to test for drtb diagnosis with the potential to get patients on the right treatment path early for every case of tb you must thoroughly evaluate investigate strive to establish a definitive diagnosis and then after you've done that establish whether it is drug susceptible or drug resistant tb if drug resistant then whether mdr xdr or any other type all said and done even after you have a definitive diagnosis even after you have started the best treatment the patient still has to follow up with you and you will be assessing him or from time to time so no amount of evidence can replace your clinical assessment and judgment of the case the final word is by these two gentlemen here the pioneers in tb to robert prof louis pasteur who say it's about time we had a good rapid test these are a few references and with this i conclude I am extremely grateful to all of you here for giving me a very patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Nikhil. Thank you so much. This was the most lucid, 
an informative session that I have ever come across without any exaggeration. I'm sure there are millions of compliments which are already there in the chat box, which I could just see. And I'm echoing the sentiments of all the attendees over here. Thank you so much. We will take the questions at the end of the session. And I would ask uh, Dr. Anirvan to please uh, carry forward. Though now I agree, Anirvan has the most difficult task. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a difficult task. It's just an impossible task right now. Uh, uh, Dr. Nikhil, I, I have to I, I have to resonate with uh, what uh, Dr. Aparna is saying, and I'm sure others are saying. Uh, uh, I am truly uh, uh, truly feel honored to follow uh, follow you, and uh, it also feels uh, after a long time feels right that uh, whatever we are doing at Haystack Analytics uh, seems a lot more. Uh, a lot more uh, valuable after hearing you. So thank you for the talk. And uh, I will try to quickly get out of hair's way so that I, I don't think I can add anything more. Uh, I, I will be uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, some of the aspects of uh, uh, genomics and, and, and uh, how uh, a lot of us believe that uh, this is going to be the standard of care. Uh, before that, uh, while Aparna has introduced Haystack Analytics, a little bit more about us. Um, like, like most other startups in, in, in India, which work in, in the biotech and, and the uh, deep tech space, we are supported by uh, BIRAC, the Department of Science and Technology. Uh, we are really fortunate to be in the IIT Bombay campus. I, I have now spent, I think, about seven years in IIT Bombay. Uh, and and uh, from one assignment to another and now with the startup. Uh, we have been very fortunate to be part of the Intel startup program, which gave us tremendous opportunity to, be, to create extremely valuable technologies which are relevant for India. Uh, and I'll come to that, why it is so important, how Intel is so important. And recently we were also selected in the GE program uh, where uh, we are now looking to take the technologies that we have made uh, to, to an international uh, scale. Uh, getting along with it, I think uh, uh, I'm, I'm reminded of, of, my, uh, of my department where I used to work at Oxford. It's, it was called MMM, Modernizing Medical Microbiology. And I hope I'm not infringing into any trademarks. Uh, and this is Modernizing Medical Microbiology. Uh, we all know uh, a, a lot of us here uh, might have started our careers with this uh, Petri dish and the uh, uh, antibiotic diffusion disk. This is how we started microbiology in our careers, and this is how we imagined uh, the world. But then there was molecular tests, and those those circles be became lines. Absence of circles became absence of lines. Presence of circles, inhibition zones became presence of lines. And then something else changed as well, uh, where we came into genomics. Each of them have their advantages and disadvantages, as uh, Dr. Nikhil has already pointed out. The biggest problem with microbiological DST is while it is, it is as close we can get to an in vivo environment, um, it is extremely, uh, uh, extremely manual and uh, it, it can be inaccurate uh, because we can only culture those which we know how to culture. And that's a paradox. Uh, if, if, if we use the same media, we, can, we will always get the same data for microorganisms which we do not know they exist we cannot create media from them for them and therefore we will never know they exist i don't want to get into this this becomes slightly confusing but all i'm trying to say is while microbiology is the gold standard for all of us we need to understand that it is extremely manual it, it can be tricky and it is not scalable definitely not scalable for a problem like tuberculosis in india molecular is uh, is scalable but again it requires the scale requires the kind of lab which makes it unaffordable while it is rapid it is not absolute the only reason it is not absolute is because we can only push in so many things you can push in 10 genes 20 genes 40 genes but what about the rest of the microorganism where is the balance between a phenotypic drug resistance where we are looking at the microorganism as a whole and genotypic uh, testing where we are looking at the microorganism as a piece. One piece 
two piece, three piece, maybe four pieces, 20 pieces? Why can't we look at the whole thing? And that is whole genome. We, the world has been doing whole genome for a while, but it has not been doing whole genome uh, like the way we are doing whole genome today. And the reason that has changed is because right now, it is cheaper to sequence a DNA than to do genotyping. And I'll give you some of the proofs on this. So what genomics has brought is it has brought to four 100% of the information. It has brought in the ability to automate. It has brought in incredible scale in microbiology. I'll talk, talk about each of them. And I'll also, as I speak, talk about where we still kind of have bridges to uh, uh, cross. If we look at genomics and, and, its, uh, and its evolution, all, we all know the 2001 Human Genome Project, uh, uh, the cost of one megabyte of DNA was $10 million. Today, Thyrocare is selling a genomic test for 3,000 rupees. It all changed significantly in 2011 when FDA approved NGS, Next Generation Sequencing for Clinical Diagnosis. And then 2015 was a watershed moment for genomics all over the world because for the first time in the history, for any disease anywhere in the world, a genomic diagnostic was launched at population scale by NHS UK and it happened to be tuberculosis. And I was really fortunate to be part of the team and experience that transformation, that modernization of medical microbiology. And I'm here to share it with all of us. What does that mean? Molecular culture versus genomics. These, these are the hallmarks of TB right now, what Dr. Uh, Nikhil spoke about. I'm sure what Dr. Uh, Chaitali will also be speaking about. There is gene expert, it's RT-PCR, it's, it's state of the art. It is, it is what molecular in the world, in the COVID era stands for, molecular. The RT PCR. Then there is the line probe assay. It's quick, it's cheaper, it's accessible. And then there is the gold standard, Mijay. Now, if you put all of that and put that for eight weeks, you get data for like 13 drugs after nine tests. And then you take a sequencer, which is one machine, you put a nice computer algorithm to it, and you get 18 drugs first day, the first report. The question that beckons us is what to choose today for a patient now. As Dr. Nikhil said, it is, it, it is, it is neither foolproof nor foolproof. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to use this without your permission. I will take your permission later, but I love that concept. The clinician has to take a judgment. And we will talk about some of the judgments which I could think of and the group here has come up with. At the end of the day, when you do genome sequencing, you're bridging the gap between the absoluteness of looking at bacteria as a whole, as a phenotype, and the piecemeal information that you get from a molecular test. You bridge that, look at the whole genome and take the best algorithm to define what that genome means. And we're doing very well at that in the world given that we are making mRNA vaccines after looking at sequences. This was what happened when we compared that test and a genome sequencing. This was done in one of the best labs, IRLs in, in India. This was the table which we started from. This is the data that we got from gene expert, LPA and midget. The red is resistant, the green is uh, uh, sensitive. Each row is a patient, what is blue? Blue is data not available. And that is a big problem. When data is not available, decision is incomplete and possibly wrong. And the cost of going wrong in tuberculosis is very high, not only for that patient, but for the society, and I'll come to that. When we did genome sequencing, this was the data. While it was a very, very critical data with huge amount of resistance, encouraging data, which now the patient was starting with abs near absolute understanding from the body of knowledge that we can get. There are no blue cells. There are additional cells. There is lineage. 
and how lineage is important. We know, many doctors know that Beijing lineage is extremely difficult to treat because it has a high amount of drug resistance and is actually very aggressive. All of this information is now coming from whole genome sequencing. Now, how can you interpret a whole genome sequencing report? It's just like LPA. It's just like any other molecular test. Just that we have changed the way genomics was presented to you. Genomics is presented in nature genetics uh, papers with variant tables, not anymore. What we are bringing to genomics is standard molecular reporting. All clinicians now know drug resistance detected or not detected. The first page of the report that you get from whole genome sequencing are the 18 drugs and if any mutation was detected or not. It's not just that. We don't keep you in the dark. We want to know, we want you to know everything. It is like your LPA bands. Instead of bands, we now give you the exact mutations. We give you which gene, what is the mutation, and which was the PubMed research ID, the, the, maybe a JAX paper or a JCM paper, which established that mutation is associated with in vitro drug susceptibility testing. All of that is available in a simple antibiogram. And today, when that patient comes, you take an informed decision. And when you take an informed decision, you're giving the patient the best chance to recover. You're giving the society the best chance to not have a patient who is transmitting drug-resistant forms of tuberculosis. When we do whole genome sequencing, it is not just TB. Because it is whole genome, we can, we can detect the non-tuberculosis mycobacteria. We can not only detect NTM, we can actually say which strain it is, which species it is. If there is a mixed infection, we are able to find that min those minor variants and flag it very early on that out of the 90, uh, 90 times we sequence this genome, 20 times we find there was a resistant allele, which means there is a minor resistant allele which will show up in three weeks and possibly show up as an amplified case of drug resistance. Whole genome sequencing provides us the opportunity to not make one critical mistake, and that is keep a multi-drug therapy, a real multi-drug therapy. When we don't do the complete diagnostics, if one drug is not working, if other drug is not working, we are looking at a therapy which is not multi-drug. While that is difficult for the patient itself, the worst part is, we are enabling another drug in the bacteria to become resistant because there is lesser amount of drug pressure on this and the, uh, the bacteria can evolve much far, um, is, there's a much greater chance of getting a mutation to the next drug. The multi-drug therapy can remain multi-drug therapy only when all drugs are known to be effective for that patient. And that is one of the critical reasons why patients default. The whole world and the whole practicing world of tuberculosis uh, knows that defaulting is one of the major problems. There are many reasons why people default. There is stigma, there is cost, all of the things. But one of the important costs is the right drug is not given very early on to many patients. The patient don't respond. They take antibiotics, which actually make them much feeble, but they don't respond. To keep them together, we need to give the right therapy. And this is not just in India. Globally, it is now known that 75% of MDR are untreated. They are untreated because of inaccurate therapy. Inaccurate therapy because of delay in treatment, delay in treatment because of un delay in diagnostics and delay in diagnostics, which results in all of these 75% MDR remaining in the population, spreading MDR, which means all patients who are not MDR are treated well. The only disease that is spreading more and more is drug resistance, and we need to stop that. When, when, when I first did the genotyping of TB in 2009, a GCM paper, I had found that there were like 3% Beijing strains in, 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 in Mumbai. This is from a tertiary referral center in Mumbai in 2019. And all of this blue is now Beijing, and we are flooded with one of the strains in tuberculosis, which is known to have high amount of drug resistance. 
we are pushing this entire treatable epidemic into a place where we are making it difficult for our patients, for our clinicians, and, and, and certainly for our country and the society. When we do whole genome sequencing, we are providing the best possible chance that there exists today to detect the right disease, to diagnose the right uh, antibiotics, and it also gives us the opportunity to discover new variants that might come. When that happens, this is how entire epidemiology changes. When we did this study in one of the slums in Mumbai, we for the first time showed a complete clonal outbreak of drug-resistant tuberculosis connected by whole genomes without asking a patient, do they know each other? That is the power of genomic epidemiology. While it doesn't matter to the patient, but it matters to all of us. It matters to all of us because we are able to intervene where it is most required. And that is the value of doing genome sequencing. It helps the patient, it helps the clinician, it helps the society. This is probably one of the reasons that made the WHO put out the first uh, 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 guidelines for whole genome sequencing. I was really, really fortunate to be part of some of the studies in India having uh, published with Dr. Camilla Rodriguez and others. NHS, as I said, was the earliest adopters of this technology. And since then, it has been our dream that we bring this technology at the right cost and the right accessibility to the entire Indian population. There's a lot of work that has happened in TB whole genome sequencing. There is a lot of evidence that has been built comparing uh, the, the reproducibility of whole genome sequencing, uh, the kappa values between, uh, between a culture and all of that. All of that work is happening and more work is happening. There are more than 80,000 genomes of TB which have been sequenced. Some of those studies I have been really fortunate to be part of. We have gone as far as and do genome sequencing in one day in a research setting. It is not yet available commercially. But then this is the way the world is moving. Genomics for TB is here. Genomics for TB is needed. And it is going to become the standard of care for TB diagnosis, at least at the screening level. And we'll see how it goes from there. This change is, is, is changing the guidelines from 2017 to the latest uh, uh, catalog that has been released by WHO is actually pushing the health system to look at genome sequencing in a, in a lot more uh, in, in a lot more uh, scalable uh, uh, manner. It is now providing opportunities to the clinicians to offer the best treatment to patients on day zero. While all clinicians will obviously start with empirical treatment, but how early can we help our clinicians to identify the best combination of drugs? And that is one of the missions that we are trying with Thyrocare here. These are the challenges which have been outlined and Dr. Nikhil has already out outlined them. We have taken all of them out by creating a software which is automated, which works every time the same way. Our team goes through the entire research that comes out through the week, gets the latest catalog from WHO, puts it out there. None of this data actually leaves the, the, the premises of, of the diagnostic center. It is really fast. It is reproducible. And most importantly, it is up to date. When a new mutation is known to be associated with a drug set beta quillin today, tomorrow, if that mutation is validated, it is available to the patients. With no change in kit, with no more uh, validation required, because the method of whole genome sequencing has already been validated. And that is the beauty of whole genome sequencing. It does not require a new kit. It just requires a change in software, it, and you are able to get the best possible outcome that is uh, that is expected anywhere in the world. How does this work out? In the current scheme of things, everything remaining the same, the sputum is collected in the best possible standards, uh, and, and we mean sputum, not saliva. Uh, we, we take the sputum, uh, there is decontamination that is done. After that, there's an enrichment step so that we get cultures and we really want to sequence uh, uh, live bacteria and not dead, uh, dead bacteria. Once we do the DNA extraction, sequence it, we get the entire 18 drug profile. Uh, one of the suggestions we have is prioritization might be for uh, presumptive XDR and MDR cases. Uh, there are a lot of clinicians who have also told us uh, a, a lot of the patients who actually have uh, 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 isoniazid resistance, um, um, uh, rifampicin sensitivity might be isoniazid resistant. So I think this is where we need to start. 
uh, rifampicin resistant or presumptive MTR and XDRTB can benefit a lot from whole genome sequencing. It has been integrated. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we are uh, running out of time. So this is if, the last slide. Great, thank you. Uh, so this has been integrated into the workflow at Thyrocare. Uh, and it has been brought in the right uh, uh, cost, uh, and we are supporting their journey through and through to enable uh, uh, the entire technology is available to all of them. Uh, finally, uh, what we really want is instead of having this entire delay for the culture DST, we can actually look at a much shorter uh, state of the art genome sequencing for all TB patients in India. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anirvan. And in consideration of the time, I would request Dr. Chaitali to please start with her presentation. We need to have some time for the Q&A sessions also. So please, we would much appreciate if it could be stuck to the time limit of 10 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Nikhil and Anirvan for such excellent presentations. And uh, as we are running late, I'm not going deep down to it, but uh, just uh, going through, uh, you know, most of the important uh, slides in just 10 to 15 minutes. So as from two presentations, all of the uh, participants would mostly by knowing that why this, you know, important or rapid diagnosis in TB is important because it's always having the uh, efficiency of the drug uh, determination for drug sensitive TB than drug resistant TB. This is the current algorithm. Just want to share the Kamrud over here is for all except gene expert and for first line LPA. Second line LPA requires smear status positive result. And without that, we cannot go ahead to know whether the patient is having, you know, XTR or PXTR TB. Again, I would like to uh, say here, I'm not going deep down into it, but yes, definitely on the on the public domain, the rule here is for the patients who are having gene expert positive low or very low result, it has to be, and if there is discordance in between gene expert and LPA, then there is a third test done on a third sample of the patient, and the result will be given on a third result. So, uh, so report will be given on the treatment regimen is starting on the public patients on the dependency of a third result. So there is lots of margin where load of a bacilli is low or very low. And if there is a discrepancy in between gene expert and LPA result, then it has to be done for the go for the third test just for a one drug that is a rifampicin. So uh, after gene expert, there is a gene expert ultra as Dr. Nikhil already told. And now there is a 10 color multiplex MDR XTR detection kit, which is available from gene expert and coming to market recently. So what I want to tell you is that each and every kit manufacturers are generally developing and adding few of the genes and genomes every time or you know after a certain period of a time when they see the change or the resistant pattern change in some of the different uh, genes and they're going to add into the their current uh, test or the strips which is available in the market. So basically how this uh, LPA result, you know, uh, matched with culture DST, it's not a which match. So there are few of the confidence, high confidence genetic marker and low confidence genetic markers. So these are canonical and non-canonical mutations where we have to check that if it is a high level resistant marker, then it can match with the DST. But if not, then there, we need to check the uh, specific quantitative DST by MIC. Then come to the DST. Again, there is the decontamination. When we got inoculum, we have to go into uh, put it into the liquid culture media or solid culture media. It takes around six weeks to eight weeks to grow. And then DST takes a again. Two weeks. So it is gold standard still time because it actually gives you the result of the present current bacteria in the sample and it gives you the susceptibility of the uh, organisms which are live. But there are few technical challenges and uh, standardization of procedures is still difficult. 
I would like to highlight over here is there are few uh, antibiotics like like Bipal regimen which has recently incorporated into the uh, into the uh, treatment regimen of 2021, which includes the drugs like bedaquiline, dilaminite, or fitinamide, where the TST is still not available at the uh, reference. Uh, it is available only at the reference lab, and it is not discriminated. So uh, the few things which we need to, uh, you know, uh, we cannot uh, avoid or we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot uh, overlook because there are few of the challenges in technical DST. So there is always a error rate for few of the antibiotics. So this is the Nikolaski um, et al, which has been published in the PLOS one, where we can see that there is a error rate in between the phenotypic DST. DST on crude extract using molecular tools and as using the on cultures. So if you can see, this is an error rate where it's substantially between drugs and PS PZA found to be a higher error prone followed by amikacin, ethanbutol and streptomycin. Whereas the proportion of incorrect result for another second line drug that is prenoquinolone and kenamycin was lower and similar to that of a first line and second line antibiotics. So this shows that there is lots of scope for the improvement in between phenotypic PDST or GDST in comparison to the in, for second line and second line rest and first line. Then this is the value of uh, whole genome sequencing, which is you know actually uh, uh, adding up the data by by lineages and uh, with the antibiotics so this slide is from the re recently uh, published article uh, from uh, cid mph from new west south africa so where you can see the arrows demonstrate the additional percentage of a drug resistant mutation detected by whole genome sequencing compared with the probe based who recommended molecular text, uh, uh, testing so this means line probe assays here for first line and second line Two, with respect to the lineages in first figure, whereas with respect to the first four antibiotic group of antibiotic, that is rifampicin, isoniazide, parathidamide, and ethanbutol. So where I want to point it out over here is that this box which is there, which actually shows the additional gain in detecting ethanbutol resistant using whole genome sequencing and compared with the inferred resistant arrow. So basically, there is a one category in line probe assay where there is an absence of wild type as well as mutant. So whether we have to take or clinician have to take a judgment on this based on the clinical presentation and the history of the patient where it is inferred. So this extra gain has been, you know, uh, come to know by whole genome sequencing in ethambutol. And it is very useful information to treat the patient when there is a problematic cases or there is a relapse cases. So this whole genome sequencing is already incorporated into the guidelines and that's the reason the need of TB whole genome sequencing rapidly shows the exactly affecting MTB, including its complete drug resistant profile and thus allow clinicians to identify the best treatment regimen to combat the disease. Also, the implementation of uh, TGS, that is TB whole genome sequencing, will benefit the NTP providing data for surveillance of resistance to different anti-TB drugs and important information for high burden countries to set TB control strategies and priorities. So taking above all facts in consideration, we at ThyroCare launched TB whole genome sequencing with haystack analysis. ThyroCare is uh, commenced 25 years back with the focus of quality and speed affordability. With the same goal, we have uh, started Focus TB, the division of fo uh, division focused on TB diagnostics. So as price-wise, we have launched it at the rate as low as 3,000 rupees, just in a small consideration format where CBNAT gives information about one antibiotic that is rifampicin, turnaround time is 24 hours, and so on time is as low as 15 to 20 minutes. Line probe assays gives you information about the targeted mutations for first and second line drugs of antibiotic or group of antibiotics and having turnaround time of four to five days. Culture DST gives you the information about 12 to 14 antibiotics. The turnaround time is more than six weeks in some cases and cost is too high as compared to TGS. Whereas TGS give you coverage of 18 antibiotics and strain identification and mixed identification and information about co-infection as well. 
it is a comprehensive with quick turnaround time and affordable test i want to highlight over here when we say about the quick turnaround time this is first year state is positive patient which gives the uh, enrichment growth or growth in the culture in just five days of a time if not then delay of a report is also possible this i can say is that the paradigm shift in the genomic reporting same as uh, gene expert where that report can anyone can you know read out and give the information to the clinician so same way we have uh, we have designed this report where red uh, antibiotic red color indicates mutation conferring drug resistant detected whereas antibiotic highlighted in green are the representations of the mutations uh, con um, conferring drug resistance not detected as told earlier this tells, uh, tells you about the strain which has been identified percent of read as well as if, if any other pathogen or species which has been identified in the report or not which has been mentioned in the clinical recommendation at the down of the report so as uh, anirban has shown in his slide that we are looking for a design to scale so we at thyrocare are uh, looking at the uh, to bring it as a complete automated solution where for the technicians also it is very easy to or had to handle dna as compared to you know pure culture we are looking for the extraction in lab automation for by which we can uh, we can uh, give absolute uh, exact same report or that uh, lab flows in liquid handling systems to each of the uh, sample with inbuilt qc and real time digital data we are looking on you know uh, with the help of lis or lim systems that can automatically fetch the data to the next shared portal or any other driven softwares so in that shell we are transitioning using tgs as the standard method of tb diagnostics by providing antibiogram of 18 drugs within 12 days at affordable cost we at thyrocare are already accredited with iso nabl cap and ntp all four certifications thank you hope aparna has finished in time thank you dr chaitali i really appreciate and this is just to put my heartfelt thanks to all the faculties who have been excellent in their presentation and so lucid in fact the uh, entire chat box is full of compliments uh, both to doctor uh, to doctor nikhil to for doctor anirvan as well as for uh, doctor chaitali so again my heartfelt thanks to all the three faculty members thank you so much most of the questions that i have seen in the chat box are pertaining to where the tests would be available and that have been answered by dr chaitali i the only thing is um, i would just like to um, in the q and a's one of the suggestion which i would definitely like to put uh, i would like to highlight in this case is the suggestion by dr pranav ish who has indicated that hope the genome sequencing is implemented in the national program and definitely we aim and hope for that too um and um, going forward we also hope that we are going to have many sessions with dr nikhil specifically we would like to name them as coffee with dr nikhil so um thank you so much the only, uh, i think there's one a uh, question we which we could take just to, is probably it's not a question actually it's a statement which says that the discordance resolution is done on the left toes specimen sent for lpa rather than on the third sample which is as per the ntp guidelines so um yeah we will take that uh, suggestion we will take that uh, as an information and i think we can conclude with this uh, session for today um thank you all the speakers and uh, uh, we'll see you again thank you thank you dr nikhil thank you thank you thank you all thank, thank you, you.